Welcome everyone. Uh, thank you all very much for coming out. It's absolutely wonderful and delightful to see everyone here at the Pontiac Creative Arts Center for an extraordinary exhibit and a wonderful evening ahead. My name is Patricia Macahon and I am the gallery and exhibition director here at the Arts Center. And this evening we've got an incredible exhibit. Over a year ago, we got approached by three artists, Richard Ancona, Larry Holmes, and Charles Parson. And they sent us this small package and inside was a lovely letter and a flash drive. And this flash drive was full of images of their work. So in 1972, 50 years ago, these three artists received their Masters of Fine Arts, their MFAs from uh, Cranbrook, a world-renowned, exceptional institution. And so when they received their graduate's degree, the Pontiac Creative Arts Center was the very first gallery and their first exhibit as young graduate artists. So fast forward, 2022, where we're here now, what they asked us is if we would host a exhibit showing the progression and <clears throat> the journey, their artistic journey of 50 years from 1972. And of course, we said yes, and this is why we're here tonight. But because of the circumstances, we weren't really able to all be in person. So we're trying something new and we're extremely excited about it. So it's a in-person and virtual exhibit. This is an amazing, compelling story. And I'm absolutely thrilled that all of you are going to be here this evening for this um, incredible experience, witnessing some wonderful, beautiful art and um, enjoying this tremendously. So thank you all for, for coming. It's, it's just incredible to see um, the energy in the room tonight. The first thing I'm going to do is um, welcome our artists and also ha we have a guest commentator this evening, Michael Stones Richard, along with the artist. The four of them are going to be talking about the images and the artwork that you're going to see. So welcome, Michael. Thank you for joining us. So the first thing I'd like to do is I'd like to read their introductory statements that uh, Richard, Larry, and Charles composed, explaining their artistic journey and giving you a little bit more knowledge about this exhibit then and now. Individual aesthetic development is a many-sided as to sensual vision that we engaged in as graduate students while at Cranbrook Academy of Art. Our 1972 exhibit at the Pontiac Creative Arts Center brought into focus visual possibilities which served to clarify the constructive direction of our MFA theses. It involved a mixing of earlier formative aspects with experimental concepts of building a painting that was interdisciplinary and by this difference was an independent form-making process that gave visibility to our work, which merged the flatness of a conventional picture plane with various three-dimensional shapes in materials to make experimental objects. This 2022 virtual exhibit gathers in our work as a pause after 50 years since we combined our Cranbrook experience with the original exhibit at the PCAC in 1972. It attempts to show some of our various directions, the difference in similarities of form and content our work has taken, which is seen in the ordering of this galleries and drawing room section. Again, Richard Ancona, Larry Holmes, Charles Parson. Thank you, and let's start the exhibit. 50 years then and now, my name is Michael Stone Richards. I'm absolutely delighted to be here. 
Um, this invitation came to me out, out of the blue and in the best possible way because a former student, a student who has been graduated now some 10 years or so from the College of Greater Studies, where I teach as a professor in, the, in critical theory and humanities. Uh, one, of, one of the most gifted students I've taught at CCS um, apparently put my name forward um, to be a moderator for tonight's, um, to, for tonight's proceedings. And when Patricia extended the invitation, she also um, shared uh, a large body of slides with me of installations from 1972, the exhibition that Richard, Chuck, and La Charles and Larry did upon their graduation from Cranbrook. So I saw slides of that 1972 installation and of the development of their work. And I was very intrigued um, by the body of work, but also I was deeply intrigued by the idea of revisiting the show from 1972. In my field in critical theory within the context of the art school, one of the most exciting developments in the last decade or so, it's been going on a, a lot longer, but really it's become prominent in the last decade, is the reconstruction of exhibitions um, at MOCAD. And one of the exhibitions that I would like to bring up at a later date in the conversation after all three uh, have presented themselves, introduced themselves, but one, not just a few years ago, um, MOCAD, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Detroit, uh, put on a reconstruction of a very, one of the most famous shows in contemporary art, Harold Zeman's great exhibition, When Attitudes Become Form. When Attitudes Become Form was a show in 1969 that had Richard Tuttle, Robert Morris, voice, all of the things that we think of as strangest and um, strangest in, contempor in contemporary art, that show was the show that introduced to a wider audience these new tendencies in anti-form, anti-illusion, etc. So this phenomenon of revisiting shows, reconstructing shows, reassessing the significance of key shows, exhibitions in the history of modern and contemporary art is a very timely one. So when Patricia asked me if I would be interested in looking at this work and being a part of the conversation, I was very intrigued that the artists themselves were saying, let us look back at our own trajectory. Let us look at this show that we did in Pontiac in 1962. And I thought that this really would be uh, a, a compelling thing to be a part of. There are a number of questions. I've just mentioned one to do with the reconstruction, the revisiting of important shows as a thing that is happening in contemporary critical practice. But there are a number of other questions to do with time, obviously. We are all <laughs> older than we were once upon a time. Um, are we the same people? What, how have our views changed? And what is the role of art in our identity? And what is the role of art in our identity when so much about art, so much about our culture and cultural history is in the process, in the, is in the process of being changed? So I, I think that there's, it's going to be a fascinating conversation and I'm looking forward to hearing Richard, Charles and Larry introduce their own work, their own trajectory. And then after each has done that, we will then open this up to a, to a conversation. I will pose a number of questions and I, I'm hoping that it might be possible as well for the audience to, to be able, to, to, be able to, to join in. So um, with that, I'd like to pass over to our first um, artist, which will be Richard Ancona, who will introduce himself and walk us take a few minutes to walk us through the body of, body of work that we will that will allow us to get familiar with his ideas and trajectory. Richard, over to you and welcome. Okay, thank you very much. I'm, I'm still taking notes on what you said. <laughs> um, I, uh, I think I'd like to start with uh, 
the idea where it first started in our backyard about a year and a half ago. Um, Vicki and I were out in the backyard and talked about that very possibility of revisiting Pontiac with uh, Larry and Chuck. And we went on and on and had a lot of fun with it. I think that lasted for a couple of days, but then I think it sank in a little deeper. And we said, you know, let's uh, try and get back in touch and see if they're interested. They just might be. And so um, uh, it's been fun. Uh, it's been actually some work that we've uh, enjoyed. Uh, we've texted a whole lot, emailed a whole lot for a year and a half, maybe hundreds, believe it or not of emails. And I think right there is a, a collection, a very interesting collection, the emails alone. Um, so um, continuing with this, I want to pause and say thanks to Patricia and Charlene for making it possible. And also to Vicki and Kona for putting together the PowerPoint. Yes. Here, here. So, um, so it, it, in a way, it's a dream come true um, to uh, be back virtually, at least in Michigan. I did pass through last year as part of our crossing the country trip, and it was very nice to meet Joy Darkham. Um, oh, and it was uh, kind of nostalgic to go to the building. Um, I'm going to kind of merge my two uh, introduction, uh, two statements, the introduction and a kind of overview of my aesthetic. But as a kid, a cousin of mine was actually a mentor of mine. Uh, Frank Alino hailed out of uh, New Haven, Connecticut. He taught at the Pear College of Art and Design. Um, there's actually a third year scholarship in his name. And one weekend, Frank was in town and we went to a football game. Frank gave me a little nudge and he pointed to a young girl who was there drawing. Uh, she had crayons out. She had a big pad, maybe a nine by 12. And Frank mentioned to me that this is the kind of thing that a person such as Norman Rockwell would pay attention to. Everybody was watching the game, but Frank pointed out to me that there was actually another game going on in the stadium. It had nothing to do with football. It had everything to do with art. And that actually stuck very, very well. I never went back. Um, now, uh, at Butera, the commercial art school moving in toward my artist statement now. Um, I hadn't done much of anything, as I said. Uh, I had nothing going except sports. However, illustration really captivated me. The program had other kinds of things going on, layout classes, sketching and drawing, as we mentioned earlier, drawing from portrait busts, plaster casts, and so on. And um, it was a three-year program. So again, illustration just captivated me. I would spend hours rendering with casein. I worked from photographs. I also worked from other pieces of art, pieces of artwork. Now, um, I think these pieces are far more nostalgic uh, in, in terms of value. I don't consider them art at all. However, ironically, given where they are in my aesthetic uh, development, they are foundational because without them, you know, I would not be maybe in art at all. I have no idea. But based on the context of where they happen, when they happen, and my commitment to them versus another passion, they were significant. Um, I also went into advertising from there and uh, was in the largest agency in New England at Bo Bernstein and um, had a great time there uh, in the art department, uh, some 32 artists in the bullpen. And I was there for about six years 
And while there, um, I think I got studious. So I decided to go back to school. So I enrolled in a BFA program at UMass Dartmouth, Massachusetts, and things changed radically. So now I'm talking about the 1960s. And uh, the difference that I think is interesting that I would ask myself is, what happened to the illustration? It's a question that I tried to answer from time to time. I had a passion for illustration, but I didn't really pursue it that much further. The answer comes in, I think, in some very good people that I had as faculty members. For example, Don Kruger, um, he had a kind of a charge of the foundation program. And it was Bauhaus-like, and we experimented with all sorts of materials. One of the key components uh, that uh, we dealt with regarding his teaching was the picture plane and experimenting with oh, visual perception, uh, how things function together, how they don't function together. Um, I had taken in some work that was illustrative. So notice that word versus illustration. So uh, Don Kruger was letting me understand that there was this facility involved that was actually getting in the way of me actually producing art. So the distance between illustration and art was now opening up, it was separating. Uh, however, again, design and fine art were really growing. And so uh, I guess my work got closer to the surface um, and uh, I thought I'd like to pursue things in terms of getting uh, into a graduate school where I could try to do more. At the time of uh, applying to Cranbrook, um, the week before I was going to move to Michigan, my father died. And so what I did was, uh, take actually a look at what I had done in undergraduate school. And I considered that to be just fine, but a little too formative, a little too safe formative. And so um, with my dad's passing, it enabled me to dig deeper. And so I looked at the house we had lived at. I looked at things like his garage, with the funny doors and uh, the angle iron and the sheet metal. And so uh, the construction of that house, the construction of his garage, which was his man's cave, that was his studio. All of that became far more real than the illustrations, far more real than uh, things that Don Kruger had said. And so I felt that this was at Cranbrook a kind of existential time for me. Post Cranbrook, I started teaching, ironically enough with my background of graphic design, illustration, commercial art, and fine arts, I got a teaching job teaching graphic design. Now importantly, one of the components of that was an interest I had in Swiss graphic design and of course, there are two waves to that. The first wave, which is conservative and um, you know, very clean and very geometric. It's very different from the second wave you know, of, say, April Griman and Wolfgang uh, Weingart, which is more playful, more spontaneous, incidental things can happen in their work where it was just, uh, in a way, a little like the Bauhaus kind of things I was doing at UMass Dartmouth. And so really at this point in time, I think it was the graphic design that influenced my fine artwork. And so what happened is that I started putting things more together. I was crossing the borders of uh, graphic design into art freely. I began to see graphic design as art, not only as communication, but fine art, uh, in and of itself. And so the idea of a client or a clientele was in a way pushed aside or at least in the background. And the idea of 
my interests and what's really important in the world, cultural issues, critical issues, critical thinking began to soak more deeply into the work. Now, if this sounds a little semiotic, that's not surprising. Um, I took, I thought it was a really good week's worth of classes, six days at RISD. It was organized by Tom Mocracy. Uh, Mihai Nadine was the semiotician. Um, the class was loaded. I learned a lot. I was, it was primarily based on um, uh, Charles Sanders Pierce's thinking. At the time, however, I was also looking at uh, Ferdinand Saussure. So the later works uh, and the more recent works are about that, which involves communication uh, that sometimes is utilized with convention and at other times conventions are taken and they are kind of rebranded, if you will, or restated, or there is an attempt to be provocative with contemporary issues. So I appreciate you listening. I think I've gone over a little bit. And for that, I apologize. That's, that's OK, Richard. Thank you very, very much. Larry, could I ask you to introduce yourself and talk us through your work? Thank you. I'll try. Can anyone see me? Probably not. <laughs> we can see you. We can see you. And OK. Here. But I can't see myself, but that's all right. I've, I've looked at myself too, too often already today. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'll say just a little bit about my own history. Um, I'm from Kansas originally, um, born uh, in Kansas City, Kansas, and uh, went to undergraduate school at a small school called Kansas State College uh, at that point in time, uh, which is now Pittsburgh State University. And uh, that was in the early 60s, uh, went from a BFA there and an MS degree uh, to teach uh, junior high art for three years until uh, Uncle Sam had other ideas about what I should do when the Vietnam War came along. I ended up joining the Navy and uh, did a, a little bit of a term there. And when I came out, taught high school for a couple of years and uh, then uh, applied for uh, admission to Cranbrook, um, legendary Cranbrook. I mean, I, I was just stupefied when I got the letter of acceptance for Cranbrook and, uh, and uh, obviously delighted. But uh, after that, uh, the, that show we did in 72, uh, there was one other thing that happened that was a real consequence to where I am right now. And that is that a, a fellow painter, um, uh, in the, uh, in the graduate program uh, by the name of James DeCamp, who may be watching tonight, I'm not sure. His wife uh, and, uh, was, uh, was a teacher who taught with a, another woman that she was hell bent on having me meet. And uh, we met uh, on, a, on a blind date and uh, we will be celebrating our 50th anniversary this summer wow. Wow. along with uh, uh, the 50th anniversary of this exhibition. So we were married in... Uh, in June of uh, 72, I guess it was. Yes. Anyway, uh, let me go on from there. Uh, after graduation from Cranbrook, um, I was lucky enough to get a position at the University of Delaware, where uh, another Cranbrook grad from uh, the same uh, class that uh, Richard and, uh, and uh, Charles were in was a uh, in a position there already and was very instrumental in me getting uh, a job there in the foundations program. Um, as years went by, I was made chairman of the department in 82, held that position until 92, went back to teaching. I was fortunate enough to uh, uh, head up the painting program, both undergraduate and graduate for about uh, almost 20 years. Uh, eventually retired in uh, 2004. Uh, before that opened up the, uh, the, the uh, University Study Abroad program in Florence, Italy. Uh, was given a, a, a Outstanding Teacher of the Year Award by the College of Arts and Science in 2003. 
was given a 40 year retrospective exhibition at the time of my retirement. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to have done about 30 solo exhibitions over the years, a variety of um, uh, group exhibitions uh, in some fairly decent uh, collections. And let me just go on with the work from here on out. Uh, this is one of the, the first few uh, uh, paintings that I did after that show. Uh, and part of what I did that last, that first year at Cranbrook was just to try, uh, try to figure out what I could do with the materials. And uh, I, I went into the program thinking about uh, both painting and sculpture and what the differences were between the two and how much of a painting could be like a sculpture uh, before it actually became one. Uh, I've always thought of myself as a painter primarily, even though these uh, particular works uh, were quite sculptural. Cranbrook had a wonderful wood shop and the uh, materials that I had been, and tools that I had been using before were pretty much hand tools. So, you know, a jigsaw, uh, a sander, hammer and nails, that was about it. But uh, the equipment that uh, the wood shop at Cranbrook had made a lot of other things possible, particularly these sort of uh, forms that were uh, very uh, curvilinear, um, undulating forms that, uh, that got to be a, uh, sort of a hallmark for a few years. This is a piece called Busby Berkeley Slept Here, um, which was actually in the Cranbrook Magazine the year I graduated. Um, this piece uh, is uh, now in the collection of the Delaware Art Museum, but uh, not because they purchased it, but because I uh, made a gift to it, uh, of, them, of it to them. Uh, some sometime after that, and we're looking at now about uh, two or three years after uh, graduation from Cranbrook, uh, those undulations began to take less of an important role and uh, uh, inclined planes began to, uh, to be more of, a, uh, of an issue than the undulations. Uh, these next few uh, images here, we, my wife and I had built a home um, and part of the materials that were left over from that were uh, styrofoam insulation. And I had been looking for a way to get away from that uh, real rigid kind of thing that, that comes out of just working with uh, wood and canvas. And uh, this is a very flexible material and allowed me to, to get uh, involved with some uh, curvilinear forms and, and to get more involved with the painting on the, pro on the surface of them. And, and that was a, a real issue for me uh, during this time. Uh, these kind of uh, various forms of patterns that uh, eventually became uh, very uh, detailed, I guess is the, is the right word. Uh, you can, it's hard to tell from this image, but those little tiny things that you see in uh, that one image are, are little tiny pyramids. Um, the, the sort of the, these are referential somewhat to uh, European pointillism and the way that they uh, move around from one part of the form to another. This last, uh, this is the last of those images that I did. And I came to the point where I was realizing that many of the elements that I was using to make uh, patterns out of were uh, things that were actually three-dimensional objects, things like pyramids, leaves, uh, shells, uh, things that didn't seem to, to fit in that notion of being uh, painted uh, sort of illusionistically on a, uh, an actual uh, real three-dimensional service. So uh, this was the last of those pieces that I did and I moved on uh, to uh, three-dimensional painting again. Uh, oops. And uh, using some of the same idea, but on a much larger scale. And you might be able to tell that the, the spaces that are here are somewhat shallow, but they open up kind of window-like and, and look through just the surface of the painting to uh, a fairly shallow layer. Uh, eventually these lead to uh, some things that become much more three-dimensional and much more illusionistic in the space that they uh, begin to look at. This being the first one of those things. I, I was looking for a form that might uh, lend itself to adapting to a, a a space that would move into it. I thought about the uh, uh, Mantegna painting of the dead Christ and uh, alligators somehow fit that. Somebody had given me a toy alligator and it, it proved to be the impetus for this work. 
Um, these uh, couple of uh, oil paintings, uh, fairly large scale, then they went on to uh, pastels. And for a number of years, I, I did these uh, series of pastel drawings, uh, some of which were uh, diptychs and triptychs. This is the, uh, an early diptych that uh, began to, to try to use a series of works that were fairly medium scale in, in terms of their own, but fairly large scale when they were composited together. This is actually only one half of a diptych. The other half is a, is a pig, believe it or not, but it, very similar. But these are all pastels. In the lurch, this is a, a, a pastel that's owned by the McDonald's Corporation. Uh, this is a floor actually from the Louvre Museum. And uh, these uh, mosaic floors uh, for a long time were coming from uh, the Baltimore Museum of Art down in, uh, in Maryland. And then eventually they, I was just, uh, wherever I could find them, uh, I, I liked their, what they could offer so much in terms of pattern and the kind of uh, animation and decoration that they could bring to the surface of uh, these things that in part um, the work has had to do with how I've uh, come to feel about uh, man's role with uh, their fellow creatures and uh, how uh, we seem to be looking down on them in the same in life and as it, uh, we are in uh, in terms of the uh, the actual images which is somewhat of an allegory. This is the last of the, uh, the bigger paintings I've done. I got uh, interested in drawing again after uh, several years, about uh, two years ago when my nine-year-old granddaughter asked me if I would give her some drawing lessons. And just in the process of doing that, I've gotten really interested in drawing again. So I've, I've spent uh, about the last two years doing pretty much just straight graphite drawings. Modest in scale, but a lot of fun to do. My, uh, my two granddaughters and I uh, were able to do a nice little show of drawings uh, about a year ago this month uh, in Wilmington, a small gallery there, which was uh, a lot of fun. I'll shut up and turn it over to whoever's next. Thank you, Larry. Charles, would you be kind enough to introduce yourself and walk us through your work? Sure. Um, you. Everybody can pour themselves another drink. Uh, it looked like a cocktail lounge there. I love it at the Pontiac Creative Arts Center. Uh, I'm Charles Parson, um, and I'm a, I consider myself a multifaceted artist. I work in drawings, paintings, sculptures, uh, dimensional wall pieces, uh, interactive installations and uh, performance works. I say that because whatever it takes to speak as an artist is how I've chosen to speak over the years. Uh, I've got over 75 one person exhibits throughout the country. And the reason I like underscoring the one person exhibits is because I don't depend on any one work to speak in a full comprehensive way. I attempt to have that occur, but I look at more the body of work, in fact, a lifetime of work, speaking more strongly to the issues that uh, I like dealing with. Um, I work in the past 15 years, a blend of abstraction and representational uh, works that uh, also are folded into architectural geometric forms that I think uh, basically are the understructure of today's real life three-dimensional um, reality. If you said though, Chuck, we're sitting at the table together, what do you deal with? In one word, I would say connections. Um, both in form and in content, I attempt to deal with how we connect with one another, how we connect with ourselves. Um, 
I attempt to use my background, uh, which was originally as a landscape painter, where you see the uh, painter framing the space that they are going to represent. Um, I feel like today I've evolved into framing what I see as the poetics that are already there in life. I constantly am, uh, when my work is reviewed, the use of industrial materials is spoken to. Well, I try to be authentic to who I am. And who I am comes from the idea that basically um, my background is from, uh, I've listed a few of my jobs. I've had a variety of jobs throughout my life that contribute to my aesthetic. Um, let's see, I've been a, a large scale steel worker, foundry man, aluminum factory worker, welding shop, um, lounge musician, oh, lounge lizard, as my wife says, an agricultural worker. Um, and I also moved into, in my adult years after I left Cranbrook, I chose to separate myself from the mainstream. And that meant I also stepped aside from the more conventional realm of teaching at the time, which I moved back into later. And uh, I became a sign painter, an itinerant sign painter, hand lettered signs. And that became my bread and butter. Included in my adult years, throughout all of my life, I've worked what I consider two jobs. Uh, Michael Stone Richards said the other day, um, he was asking, do we do work exclusively as an artist or do we make time to make the work? Uh, I feel like I've always had two full-time jobs. And in saying that, um, it's interesting to now be retired from teaching and have the joy of taking an afternoon nap uh, in my studio rather than just putting my head down, continuing to work. Um, in my adult years, uh, by adult, I mean after graduate school, uh, I have found that I've worked as a museum exhibit designer in the world of natural history museums. I was also for 25 years a contract muralist and illustrator for them as well as a sign painter, fabricator, graphic designer for uh, a range of businesses which influenced my fine arts in my initial introduction of myself here. And uh, that included working for a concert promoter. So I was able to be backstage on a regular basis and have conversations with um, individuals such as B.B. King, Stevie Ray Vaughan, uh, people from my high school era, um, and the, the walk up to Del Shannon and, and have that, that statement that, oh, I've been playing your song in lounges for 25 years and his whole body sagged because it aged him. Uh, I found it interesting to connect with these icons and find out they were real people. And that brings me back to uh, when we first got together to do the exhibit at the uh, Pontiac Creative Arts Center, what held us in common, I think, besides the intensity of Cranbrook was Cranbrook was, I think, in a interesting transition of uh, which direction it might go looking at both traditions and innovations, we three were doing that with our own, by then established works. And in doing that, the commonality we had was, we all were working very dimensionally, but still dependent on the wall. And for me, I moved onward to a more sculptural form. A gift I gave myself when I left Cranbrook the summer I graduated, was I purchased a 10-speed bicycle, worked out, and then uh, got a ride out to Eastern Utah and took a ride through the desert. That was my aha experience, my epiphanal moment in which I came back to Michigan. I taught at, um, it was at that time called Genesee Community College. In addition to my first ever teaching job I had had continued, 
That was at the Pontiac Creative Arts Center. You got to imagine this 24-year-old kid with hair halfway down his back, weighing 125 pounds, with bell bottoms. And the only thing that would keep me from blowing over were my bell bottoms. And here I am teaching in Pontiac, living nine blocks from the school. It was a culture shock for me to move out west. And I moved out west because of the bicycle ride. I think we all have epiphanal moments in our lives. And in those epiphanal moments, when do you make a change? Um, as I moved out west, I was had been deeply influenced at Cranbrook by uh, Michael Hall, who helped me merge my life experiences in terms of especially making a living with my art. And so I attempted to look at who my audience was, what my materials were, and as we're kind of stepping in right here, I list some of the locations where these works were seen simply because the narratives were really interesting. The current piece that's on display uh, is the dialogue between my brother and I when I got the phone call the night he passed away and my sister called and said, you just need to know your brother just passed away. And it was like a thin thread breaking. Well, this is a common theme that we all universally share, the death of a loved one, but we individually experience. And so the two pieces of plexiglass are my height and my brother's height. And there were two thin red lines of thread running at eye level. The, and then the horizon line, which unites us all, uh, is running in between the work and then white sand on the bottom with an indentation of a slot, like a slot canyon. That is a typical narrative uh, that has woven through all of my work. If uh, Charlene, if you can just kind of continue, I'm not sure where we are in the works. Uh, I have blended the sensibility of the individual view. So here's a sculptural work looking straight at that compressed narrow six foot tall negative space that is framed of the individual. And then on the back wall is the same proportion, same size canvas wall construction, similar to what Richard and Larry and I were doing 40 years earlier. Uh, and this wall piece has a muted um, mirror that reflects the viewer into the space. Next one, please. Um, I've, I've got an image kind of cut off here. This is basically memorial pieces to uh, a sculptor that was so influential to me in my undergraduate years at the Kansas City Art Institute, uh, Dale Eldred. And uh, he made very large masculine works at the time. And then he was killed in a studio accident. And I did a portrait of the space he occupied, the memory on the right, if we can just kind of keep going. And the same theme existing here, I'm not gonna talk about each work, uh, smaller scale works, wall constructions, you see the implied horizon line and then the vertical space. Um, you can go to the next one. Um, Charlene, you're doing great. Put a $20 bill in your tip jar. Um, the idea that also part of my master's thesis at Cranbrook referenced the um, luminosity that George Ortman spoke to constantly as our painting instructor, uh, the luminosity of Rothko's work influenced me. So this work that you're looking at has a dimensional lip that is horizontal that casts that shadow. On the top of that is a piece of mirrored acrylic and it, the light would hit it and cast up these shadowed shapes where it looked like the work was physically glowing and it was just visually glowing. And the cast shadows go back to, I read all the time. And uh, the cast shadows were from the fourth canto of Dante's Inferno where only life forms in the other world cast shadows. Um, we can keep going. Um, 
a, a representative uh, three-story tall interior work in which I'm so interested in the architectural structure of what frames that spiritual space that we each individually have in the idea of being grounded and then ascending upward. Next, please. Uh, typical, uh, how am I doing time-wise? You're okay, keep going. Okay, um, the previous work and this work um, invite a viewer to walk in, a, a representative sound installation. So you have to imagine in this work, which was 50 feet by 50 feet, uh, at your shoulder level, it's as if you are swimming in a pool and there is light green thread on the top of all of these steel pipes that permeate in a very Donald Judd-like uh, repetitious manner in the whole room. As you walk into the singular area, only one person is visually invited in, there is an eight foot diameter uh, concave disc underneath the feet, a convex um, disc overhead, and an individual would stand there and the, I had electronic microphones in which your footsteps were amplified over your head. And as individuals would stand in here, a natural gestural dance would occur for everyone that was outside looking at someone responding to the sounds that they were intuitively making. Next, please. This is a similar work uh, about 10 years ago in which um, the two panels on the left and the two on the right were basically sound sculptural chambers as if they're almost prayerful. Uh, since this art exhibit was in a former church, I thought interesting places of structured contemplation and reflection, whether churches or art museums, uh, this presents a different in interest to me of who the audience is and what they would be experiencing. So each one of these individuals on each side uh, are hearing recordings made off of microphones on my feet of my four favorite places to walk in America. One was on a beach. One was on a 14,000 foot independence pass um, here in Colorado, where each step crunches the light gravel. Um, the central piece in the back there is a picture of me in which um, I gave the choice to the viewer that there was no amplification, but there was the natural sound chamber, such as if you put your hand cupped in front of your mouth and then you talk to yourself, it's a very personal space. And as I developed a sound chamber overhead and a cup space underneath, I had crushed gravel. And again, individuals would be shuffling their feet and you would suddenly see natural gestures and dances. Next, please. Some of the most recent works, um, this is a typical type of um, represent, we'll go back to this one for a minute, please, uh, of uh, proposing a uh, 70 foot by 90 foot um, work and then it grew <laughs> for a, a museum exhibit in which I'm interested in the individual space. And so I made troughs that only allow one person at a time to physically be there. And then the surrounding um, drawings going all the way around the wall merged looking 360 degrees representationally into 360 degrees uh, abstractly where those abstracted marks came from. This came from um, me looking at the top of a hill at an art retreat, which we're gonna see pictures of to finish this up. Um, an art retreat in Southern Colorado that I was allowed to go to after 10 years ago, experiencing two heart attacks, and I was told I could only lift a pencil. I couldn't make any sculpture or anything. 
I was reading some Ram Das at the time and began to realize, and as well as John Keats, and realize that there was a very still and centered point that I was at, not only physically, but visually and in my life metaphorically, where yeah. I was looking at, you know, at, the, this. at the same mountains, 360 degrees at our art retreat. And so I was able to spend a year drawing those methodically and transposing that problem into a gift of sorts as the next inspirational point. Okay, if we wanna hit the last couple of images yeah. here, uh, this is from the same exhibit. I'm going to have uh, uh, Charlene keep going. Uh, the, yeah. And so these are uh, three images from our art retreat. And uh, that combined with, I'm holding a book up, uh, The Sanctuary of the Moment is a book that uh, I originally wrote 25 years ago after another serious studio accident in which I was almost killed. I came to embrace the idea of there are moments that we need to embrace and frame in our lives individually and as a culture. And so all of these sculptures tend to do that. Uh, next image, please. And there are uh, 35 of these uh, next to uh, 35, on 35 remote acres, um, there are uh, 55 sculptures. And that was the adobe and steel cabin that my family and I made as a place for uh, private invitations of poets, of composers, of other visual artists to come and for me to spend a rich moment with them. The, the final images you can swing through pretty quickly because I've gone long are some of my most recent drawings. My most uh, current one person show just came down and it had uh, 75 works in it. Nine of them were sculptures and the rest of them were wall constructions or drawings such as you're seeing here. And sure, that, that probably you. brings me to a close. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you each of you for a wonderful, forceful, a very clear presentation, a very thoughtful presentation. There are way, way too many questions. I want to ask you about the 1972 show. I want to ask you about the significance of the name that you gave yourselves, the constructionist. Not the constructivist, but yeah. the constructionist. I, yeah. I would love to know more about that sense of what you understand by construction and one can see it in the work. I was struck, Charles, when you said that what all three of you have in common at that time was the dependence on the wall, mm -hmm. right? Now, for the audience, this, this is not to get too technical into art talk, but when I mentioned the I great think. show from 1969, when attitudes become form, precisely the significance of that great show was that it got rid of the dependence on the wall and everything went onto the floor or everything went on to, into corners. I'm throwing out a few things that we may come back to, but let me get to what I, as this viewer, thinking about work in the what the last three or four weeks um, since Patricia asked me and listening to you tonight I'm struck each of you has incredible fluency thoughtfulness in the way in which you address your own work as one would expect for me it's not the dependency upon the wall it's not even the reliance on structure which is so obviously very strong in your work. I'm going to make another suggestion. There is in each of you a developing preoccupation with intimacy. That what I see emerging in the work over the years is intimacy. In Richard's work, 
And this is not just when Richard spoke of what it meant that he would think about the passing of his father, go into, go into the garage. That was the father's man den, as it were. When I, look at the, when I look at the drawings, I see the drawings becoming more intimate, intimate in terms of the engagement with the body. And Richard's work seems to blur the distinction between figuration and abstraction precisely at the moment when he wants to be more most intimate. Larry, after leaving behind first a kind of biomorphism, then a kind of angularity, and return emerges then with this extraordinary kind of neo-surrealism, forgive me, Larry, um, that's not a dirty word for me, a kind of neo-surrealism, the, the, the emergence of these dreamlike compositions that have a still life quality. And I see that as also an exploration of intimacy. And I'm not surprised when you go on to say that you've been teaching your granddaughter to draw or drawing with her. And then Charles, extraordinary, extraordinary body of work that you talk about characterized by very strong formal structural preoccupations. But what speaks to me through that work, again, is intimacy. It's listening. It's recording sounds. It's, you're quoting Keats at the still, the still, still and centered point, or it could be Eliot at the still point of the turning world from the four quartets. And that even when it's performance, it's intimacy. I find that there is on the surface, of course, this very strong structural concern. But what I find by the end of this, I'm just absolutely struck. So I'm putting aside all of my other questions. If anyone in the audience would like to pick them up, they can. But what I find, um, guys, is an absolute overriding arrive concern with arriving at a language of intimacy. That's my claim to an insight. Now, when I say an insight, I'm, I'm putting it out there as, to say, what do you think? Um, that's what this viewer has learned from listening to you and looking at these works. Does it make sense? Where can we go from there? It, it absolutely makes sense to uh, Chuck here. Um, I'm not sure if the audience was going to jump in or what, but um, some of the current writing on my most current work um, underscores what you've just said. Um, a, a, a critic in particular is addressing this. Um, I also think that um, in this language of intimacy, I wonder is part of that due to our age and a certain um, position one is in as you are in your um, waning years where you take a look at that kind of um, need as opposed to more public. Um, I, I find it interesting what you bring up and I, I see the relationship that you're um, speaking to. Larry, do you have any thoughts? One of the things that was cited in reviews from that original show, the, some of the, uh, the motivation, although I think some of this was conjecture on the part of the, uh, uh, the writer, but was looking at that undulation and, and curves and all this having to, uh, to do with figural abstraction in one way or another. And uh, uh, I suppose an intimacy that was involved in that. But yes, I mean, it was true also in the fact that I had been through a time in my life where uh, uh, I'd gone through a, a good deal of uh, anguish and turmoil and had come out the other end uh, caring about uh, some 
uh, well, I'll say women uh, that I had uh, uh, didn't know that I was going to ever meet and, uh, and ended up having a very significant impact on me for uh, the couple of years before going to Cranbrook and for the 50 years thereafter. <laughs> I mean, I'm still with uh, that one who's having the greatest impact on me of all. So. so I don't know if that answers the question or not, does it? It's a response to the question. It's not the answer, but it, it, oh, it, does, it, it does tell us that there is something very important there. Richard, I don't want to interrupt. Sorry. Um, yeah, I, I think there is both. Uh, yeah, an intimacy. And also, uh, importantly, a context. I think, well, for example, when Chuck was talking about those separate units or stands within a building that was a church. So the space between the work itself, the people, the um, process of them participating in something there and the structure in which it exists has eliminated any separation. So the work itself has no boundary. Um, the work itself takes over that building and becomes, it re-identifies that church or that building. You know, it's uh, maybe I want to think of Robert Rauschenberg, you know, who takes in things. And uh, because of what he's taken in and the way it's shown, uh, again, there's a, a reduction in elimination of the space uh, between the work and culture between the work and reality. And in that sense, I do appropriate the idea of intimacy uh, because the world is not an object. When it's engaged, the idea that comes forward or the word that comes forward is in fact intimacy. Um, maybe I you know, see that in one work of mine, uh, for example, um, a construction that has uh, Oh, uh, pyramid-like forms around it and stained glass in the center. It's uh, To me, it's a kind of oh, huge ball of dough. I've done some uh, cooking classes, uh, taking cooking classes in terms of raising dough. So, um, you know, it's the kind of form as dough that, that is growing and expanding. The proteins are not just limited to a bowl, but they are in a sculpture form. And um, they, uh, they have no boundaries. Another form to mention is the uh, ping pong uh, would-be table that is on the floor. And so we're looking down, down at the piece. If, if that were on the wall vertically, it wouldn't make as much sense. So I would define intimacy by what the context is. And so I think intimacy is context contextually based. There's another way of thinking of intimacy and Richard's precisely in your presentation, um, one of the parts that I found personally most compelling was where you started to speak of graphic design strategies, language, entering your, pra your fine art practice. Basically, you're doing away with the distinction between graphic design and, and fine arts, but you're saying the way that you expressed it was, if graphic design is concerned with communication, what now happens if we begin to realize that, well, there isn't anything that is not concerned with communication. So the communication isn't just Form. And, there, and I think that the other, I mean, a structure, sorry. And I think another way of thinking about intimacy, which is one of the things I see in all three of you, is it's about the boundaries of intactness, the intactness of the body, whether we're speaking of a physical body or whether we're speaking of a representational body. So when sounds, sounds don't know boundaries in an ordinary sense, right? So in that sense, then, intimacy can be when the intactness of the body, either the representational or literal body, is in some way uh, overflown, overflowed, 
one it's overflowed it's in some way the the body doesn't remain its self dream is one of the ways in which we experience that sound is another way in which we experience that the dissolving of form which is what i see in some of those amazing drawings that you shared with us richard so each of you seems to me to have this practice where at certain moments you are all sort of really coming up on this sense that the body is not intact. And I'm saying that the structure is almost at certain points concealing that to say, oh, but we, each of you is searching for something. And because there's a precision in your language and I'm saying, but the precision in your language is standing in for this something else, which I'm, I'm surmising or what I detect is this overflowing of boundaries, which is precisely what structures can't contain. So be it dream, be it sound, be it the, dis the dissolving of form in, in drawing and painting. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Michael. I'm going to open it up to our audience to see if anybody's got any questions at this point. Is that acceptable? Of course it is. Okay. Absolutely. Hi, artists. Uh, I have I have a couple of questions. Uh, one is for uh, let's see, Chuck. Chuck, I noticed that you that you used a lot of materials that were very permanent looking, meaning that a nuclear bomb probably couldn't destroy them. But I'm I'm wondering about the use of plexiglass and the permanency of that. And if you have any regrets about using that, since it scratches, since it cracks, since it breaks, or if you would ever consider going back and replacing materials that you think at the time were appropriate, but maybe are not the state of the art today. Interesting question. Thank you. Um, I, I think works age. Uh, I think there's a natural aging to them. I give as an example, um, a bronze statue uh, is absolutely pristine and uh, polished when it comes out of the foundry. And over the years, the copper in it turns to a very different patina, a very different color. Uh, weatherization takes on a fact. Um, uh, my works, uh, a lot of them, um, are temporary in nature, some of the larger ones. So I have not worried about that archival nature um, for the uh, installation works in particular, because it is for a sustained, uh, usually 90 days to 120 day uh, installation. And plexiglass, se secondly, are, are acrylic, clear acrylic, uh, permeates our world. And I like the idea that it sets up a certain glazed uh, surface in between each phrase that I am attempting to make in my wall constructions. And so um, when there are occasional scratches, unless I want something really pristine, uh, it's like glare on a uh, window when I used to be a sign painter and I would see reflections of people on the street behind me while I was looking in the window at the people eating at the restaurant. Meanwhile, I'm right on the surface lettering the name of the diner. Uh, those surfaces and reflective nature um, are, are fine with me. Okay, great, thank you. And I just have one other question for Larry. Uh, Larry, you mentioned your undulating work that you did at Cranbrook, it looked like, where you yeah. had an elaborate wooden framework made. Yeah. And I, I was wondering how involved, you said that you had a, a fantastic wood shop at that time at Cranbrook. Uh, how involved were they? Did, would you pr present a design to them and they would construct it for you completely? Or you would go in when it was being constructed and say yay or nay? What was the process? Oh. Uh, it was me uh, stumbling along in the in the wood shop uh, uh, and turning on the bandsaw and uh, 
figure out what kind of, how much of a severe curve could I cut with it? Uh, what would I have to do with that edge after it was cut to uh, stretch a canvas across two of those things that were parallel to each other so that it didn't reveal the, that in, inner edge uh, by sanding uh, the bejesus out of it? Um, so it was, it was me sort of finding my way. Um, the people at Cranbrook, uh, they, were, they were marvelous in the fact that they would give you all the advice that you wanted but uh, it, it had very little to do with what I was up to at the time. So the joinery that you were using was a made up type of joinery. Did it hold oh. over time? Uh, well, uh, it has held up, yes. And it was nothing more complicated than nails and Elmer's glue for the most part. Um, no complicated uh, uh, joints of any kind, uh, no cabinetry uh, coming to bear on it. I mean. I'm I'm just, I'm I'm not that that sort of compulsive and well I'm I'm compulsive enough as I as I am but not that compulsive but anyway I hope that answers your question. My name is David Mandelberg. Hello, David. I did see two uh, two things that were pretty clear. One was the. Uh, Pretty strict realism in uh, in uh, Richard's uh, early work, and in the middle period of um, the animals' pictures in the middle, middle were quite realistic, and um, also that's in terms of the realism. In terms of the content, um, Chuck's later worked there in relation to his brother passing away. Okay. I thought that when he, when he explained it, I thought that the content was quite clear. So you have these two poles of uh, clarity. What I was interested in is the kind of, um, he mentioned figurative abstraction. Uh, the, some some sense of tying together these two poles, and um, you know, it's taking some sense of Lipschitz and Cubism or something like that, with the figure and the abstraction working together at the same time. You can tie the two of them together. Uh, I mean, the, we are. We're two different individuals or three different individuals. And we all have our own point of views about those kind of things. In fact, I, I mean, the artists that you've mentioned, uh, Lipschitz, and you know, I think they would have difficulty being tied together to other artists in terms of content and meaning in their work. And I mean, for me personally, I'm probably as much motivated by how something looks as, uh, as much as I'm about what it means and how it can generate uh, a compelling image that is somewhat total uh, without the specifics of a, a tortoise or um, uh, a flower or mosaic or whatever. It's, it's the way that those things add up that can mean something more than they are individually. And I try not to interfere with what that might be. Um, I just let them sort of write their own story, if that makes sense. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This was incredible. It was unbelievably delightful um, for me to see everything in the entire uh, body of work of you three artists. And I'm just... I'm going to quote one of my absolute favorite designers, who is the architect I am Pei, who just uh, died last year. Yes. And um, I always, I, there's a, uh, a documentary that he made, and the title is I am Pei, First Person Singular. And I always showed this documentary to my students. And he is talking about, I am Pei, he's talking about his close relationship with Le Cabousier. And uh, 
because you know they were architects and the, the, their paths crossed many times. But um, what I am pay, how he connected with his friend Le Cabousier, it wasn't so much about his architecture, but it was the paintings that he produced during that time. And when you hear I am Pei talk about it, he says, artwork of that time, a painting of that time. And this, this sort of like understanding that time and not everything has to be, has to have longevity, meaning I loved, loved the fact that the work from 1972, it was of yeah. that time period. Yeah. And as your work progressed 50 years, I love the fact that the work of 2020, um, you know, this decade looks like this decade. It, it's sort of like, I, I know I sound sort of dorky, but it's just that okay. I enjoy that tremendously to see five decades and that understanding mm -hmm. that you're in the moment all these influences, whether it's cultural, politically, economically, whatever, influences your work. And I, it was, it was beautiful, it was evident. And I just, I enjoyed that immensely. So that's what I wanted to say. Could I offer a final thought? Yes. Yes, please, Larry. I, I, I'd feel terribly negligent if we didn't say something about George Hortman, who yes. was, so important to not just the three of us, but to I think anybody who ever studied with him um, and what an impact uh, he made on our thinking and uh, the work that we made and the work that we felt was possible to be made even um, because of the, the direction that he had taken in his own work. The, I mean, as head of the painting program, who wasn't making paintings at all, uh, gave us a lot of liberty and uh, it was greatly appreciated. And I think we've all grown from it. And uh, he passed away, I think maybe uh, two years ago or so, about age 94. Wow. And uh, I had a chance to, to visit with him in Maine about four or five years ago. And he was as sharp and as alert as he ever was working on some uh, reinterpretations of uh, Picasso's Guernica in drawings, which yeah, were pretty fascinating. <laughs> he was a very, very bright. Larry, Larry, sorry to interrupt you. When you say that he was working on some reinterpretations of Picasso's Guernica, do you mean as an artist or as a scholar or a writer? No, as an artist. Uh, uh -huh. he, uh, we visited him in Maine at his studio and he he took us on a tour of the studio and he was working on some very large drawings of, uh, of Guernica that were pretty marvelous, actually. I bet. I bet. Maybe, 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 maybe Patricia, those drawings should come to Pontiac. Wouldn't that be a, let's get, let's get it to Southeast uh, Michigan. What do you think? Yeah, let's get it to Southeast That's Michigan. Amazing. Well, there should be quite a few people um, who would be, in a position to support a project like that by a former distinguished um, Cranbrook artist in residence. Yes. So, anyway, anybody have any further comments or questions you would like to ask? Uh, I just wanted to comment that I I really enjoyed. I'm sorry to say I had never I had never seen any of your work before, so I was happy to be invited tonight. And um, I thought that each one of your works, uh, each one of your your works really drew you in, in its own way. Um, I, I think Chuck's, I, I, I wanted to walk through what looked like you were underwater. I wanted to walk through that plexiglass. It, it, all your works really invited you in. Um, and Richard's, I, I, I wanted to touch all those odd angles that I, I really wanted to get in there and, and feel it in, in, very, in a very tactile way. And, and uh, Larry, I'm really glad that you're granddaughter asked you to teach her how to draw because I thought some of those three dimensional those photo like that I don't know what the term is but that realism in your in your in your pencil sketches were was just incredible well thank you I would just like to uh thank Michael for doing a really fine job 
Uh, we appreciate uh, your insights, your reflections, and also the way you were able to keep the flow going. Uh, thank you very much. This, this, that was easy for me. Uh, that was easy because there's something, as the last gentleman said, there's a lot that is so powerful and brings you into the work. And there's a lot more that I, I, I'm going to be thinking about. So thank you very much for this opportunity. And a huge thank you to uh, Patricia, Patricia and Charlene and a lot of the folks behind the scenes there that we- Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you. It, that, that was, it was, it was a real pleasure. And I really look forward to what we're going to be doing next. I cannot thank you enough for reaching out to us because I think tonight was an incredible experience for all of us. This is brand new to all of us, uh, this sort of virtual half live, but uh, hybrid. thank you. Yeah, hybrid, that's a very good word. Hybrid, that is the word. That is the word, right? And Michael, thank you. Absolutely, Richard, yes. thank you. Chuck, thank you. Larry, thank, thank you. you. You mentioned Vicki, who is phenomenal. Yeah. They, they're enthralled. They're absolutely engaged. They loved everything that you showed them. I'm, I'm, I'm just honored that we were able to do this. And uh, thank Proud. you. I'm, Mary, proud. I'm proud. I'm really proud. Yeah. So thank you, gentlemen. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. We'll thank you. Sure.